Welcome back to State of Belief Radio, everyone. I'm Welton Gaddy. As a pastor of 20 years in Louisiana, I think I'm particularly qualified to be shocked uh, at the integrity and audacity of my next guest. At extraordinarily high personal cost, Jerry DeWitt has gone from serving as a fundamentalist faith leader to founder of a chapel serving humanist and atheist persons, all without leaving the intensely conservative and intensely Christian community of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Recent headlines have reported on the novelty of so-called atheist churches, a big city movement birthed by two British comedians that is growing under the umbrella name of Sunday Assembly. But doing so in Lake Charles poses a different set of challenges altogether. Now, there's no question that the very notion of church for non-believers makes many who claim traditional religions intensely uncomfortable. To that, without any malice, I say, good. Too often, there's a subtle subcontext in American religion that could be described as, what's good enough for me should be good enough for thee. More broadly, enforced conformity is not hard to find, especially in the South, and maybe particularly in Louisiana. So I'm eager to meet a man who is following a vocation with no instruction manual in such an unlikely place, and I'm happy to welcome him right now, Jerry DeWitt. Welcome to State of Belief Radio. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you, and I, I hope I can live up to such a wonderful introduction. Oh, you will. Uh, now, I, I just want to get clear right here at the very beginning. Uh, St. Charles has not become a hotbed of liberalism, has it? <laughs> no, it, it certainly hasn't. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, um, Lake Charles, Louisiana is, just as you described it, very conservative. I actually live an hour north of Lake Charles, Louisiana, in DeRitter, which is uh, maybe even more conservative yeah. and, of course, much, much smaller. Uh, my hometown is only 10,000 strong. Uh -huh. So uh, this is not only a conservative area, it's a very well-knit, very closely related conservative area. Okay, so Jerry, we've both now have all of our listeners wanting to move to uh, to <laughs> Louisiana. So there's, there's great food. <laughs> would you uh, would you briefly describe your history there and what led you to such a dramatic transition? Sure. Um, besides just some um, momentary geographical lapses. I have lived in and around the Dritter Lake Charles area all my life. I'm now 44 years of age. And so at age 17, I was uh, saved at Jimmy Swaggart's church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I immediately went into the ministry, the, um, the denomination of my grandparents, which was Pentecostal. Matter of fact, we prided ourselves on being holier than Pentecostals and referred to ourselves as apostolics. And so for the next 25 years, one degree or the other, I was in the ministry, uh, sometimes evangelizing, sometimes pastoring. And I even added to my public service working at City Hall hmm. in Derrida, Louisiana. I started off as the code enforcement officer and later on uh, ended up being the mayor's chief of staff and the director of community service. I pastored uh, two different churches as the senior pastor. I was the associate pastor for several different churches. And as I stated earlier, I spent about 10 years on the highways and byways evangelizing uh, mm -hmm. within a very, very strict Pentecostal denomination. What happened that triggered even the thought of stepping out of that tradition and I embracing um, atheism and uh, humanism and those kinds of uh, other uh, ideologues? I left Christianity and the ministry in particular, kicking and screaming. I, I did not want to leave. I was not looking 
to leave. I I fought for years intellectually. I fought with my conscience. I fought with the doctrine for years um, in order to try to stay, in order to maintain a place within my community and, and within my church world. So the first, the very first catalyst for change was all the way back at the very beginning of my ministry when it became my responsibility to preach the doctrine of eternal punishment and hell. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I took very seriously. And, and what I like to say is is that it's it's been my love for truth, my love for humanity, and at the time, my love for the God that I was brought up believing in that forced me to consider these issues and over time to change my worldview so substantially that it would have to literally change my world as well. Mm-hmm. I, I'm... Uh... It's a curious question that I have, and I don't. Uh, I don't want to convey any implicit uh, sense of superiority about a position. But sure. do you think that being in the fundamentalist tradition um, caused you to react with? a strength that might not have been there had you been in a more progressive position? Absolutely. I I think, um, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but I I have a memoir out, Hope After Faith, and I think that's a very clear narrative all the way through the story. I was was taught— to to take things and this is now I'm going to sound like I'm being superior or okay. egotistical in some way but I was taught to take things um extremely seriously mm-hmm. and to attempt to bring the god of the bible into my everyday life uh, right. not just a sunday morning experience not some type of um of mixture of worldviews or philosophies as we see in in a lot of modern forms of Christianity, but to try to relive, to try to enact the very uh, dedication and, and the lifestyle of the apostles themselves. That, mm-hmm. That's why we called ourselves apostolic. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, that, that definitely forced me to live a very particular kind of life. Now, let me be clear. By the way, your uh, your book just came to my office yesterday, so I haven't had sure. time to read it. And so if I uh, ask you a question that's uh, answered in there, it's it's because I haven't read it yet, but I am going to read it, and I hope our well, listeners I, do too. Well, um, I, I recommend it, and I equally recommend the audio book because I read it. And so what more could you ask oh, for? Good. My story in my own voice. Uh, Jerry, tell me how how far have you changed, or how much have you changed? Have you uh, have you given up theism? Have you uh, where where are you on that spectrum? This is the way that I like to describe it. I, I developed a little creed uh, as soon as I began to tour within the secular movement. I, I quickly um, learned that different groups called themselves by different names, and I've always sought unity anywhere that I could find it. So what I say is, I say that skepticism is my nature. Hmm. That makes me a skeptic, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That free thought is my methodology. Mm-hmm. That agnosticism is my conclusion. And the way that I like to phrase that is that after 25 years of being in the ministry, I have more questions than answers. Hmm. So agnosticism is my conclusion. Then atheism is my opinion. It's mm-hmm. simply an opinion that I hold at this time. But lastly, and most importantly, humanism is my motivation. And what I realized was I had actually been a humanist all along. Yeah. So I don't feel any different than I felt when I was in the ministry. Obviously, I do not believe in, in, in theos, you know, theistic mm-hmm. uh, belief systems right. anymore, but I still consider myself to be the same loving person that I always was. Now, how have the people who've known you all of these other years treated you since you have uh, announced uh, where you are now? You know, it's it's ranged from being completely disowned by family and friends uh, to I've even had threats, different types of physical threats at different times, usually by strangers, not by, you know, the polite people of the South, all the way to um, sympathy 
you know, people don't realize that sometimes it actually sounds insulting when they find out about your change of beliefs and they say, well, I love you anyway, as if you've been convicted of a crime and they're going to love you anyhow. Um, So the reaction has varied. But in the South, I, I really feel as if there's a silent yet polite hostility. It seems as if the um, the the way that most people are handling it is by attempting to ignore it. Now, once I, you know, every time that I get a little bump in the media or Community Mission Chapel gets a bump in the media, then social media will have its day mm-hmm. for a little while, and then it all quietens back down into, as I call it, a, a polite hostility. But they do love you. <laughs> but they do love me anyway. Yeah, as if I'm as if I'm a convicted child molester or something. That's, that's you know, right. which which speaks towards one of the reasons that I refused to move uh-huh. because I felt as if I was being treated as if I had done something wrong. I was 17 years old whenever I started in the ministry. If I did didn't make changes by the time that I was 42, something would have been wrong. And so I, I felt like to move was, was almost like a, a plea bargain, mm. you know, almost like pleading guilty so that you can have probation instead of going to court. Yeah. And I, I felt like that wasn't the appropriate thing to do. You know, Jerry, the, uh, of, uh, of all of what you've said, the, the thing that I found most difficult to understand was why you didn't move, because right. I know it has to be uncomfortable. It is, and, and it, it is uncomfortable. It's limiting. It's, it's a strange experience. I, I, I embedded myself in the community. I love my little town. Like I said earlier, I've even worked at City Hall. And so at one time, I had a level of clout. Mm-hmm. You know, I never abused it. I would obey the speed limit, but I would do so as to not embarrass the officer when they pulled me over and saw who I was. Yeah. Now, I'm uh, much more, much more aware of all the rules and laws because sure. I don't, I don't feel as if there's, um, as if there's any special treatment that I'm going to receive now. Right. And so it's, it's, it's awkward. There's no doubt. It's awkward being a stranger in your own community, mm-hmm. but. Every day, it gets a little better. Every day, um, more doors open up. Every day, someone meets me who hasn't seen me since all of this has happened, and they're surprised to see that I'm the same person I've, ever, I've always been. Every day, I'm recapturing this sense of community and love that I had for 25 years with my town. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Tell us about the chapel. Where did the idea come from for Community Mission Chapel, uh, and what's it been like? So Community Mission Chapel is wonderful. We're still just really getting it going. We haven't yet um, met nearly any of the goals that we're looking forward to, and I can tell you about them later. But basically what happened, December the 1st, 2011, I was fired from a job that I had taken in order to remove myself from the ministry, trying to commit what I call identity starvation, But unfortunately, I was outed. Everything got in a turmoil. It all made the papers and such, and I had to commit identity suicide. Mm -hmm. But as I began to tour in the secular movement, what I quickly realized was just my mannerisms alone seemed to people as if I was preaching. Mm -hmm. And there was a few people that were bothered by it. They'd been traumatized in some type of fundamentalist church. But by and large, people who had come up in the same background that I had been raised in They felt a sense of closure by hearing someone speak, not just in a Southern way, but but in more of a a preaching style. And so I paid attention to that over the course of the last two years as I've traveled, and I realized that there is a nostalgic need within many of the lives of secular people, particularly those who are in the South. Mm -hmm. They're looking for that same sense of community. They're looking for those same cultural elements that they were raised to appreciate, but they're looking for them without the mythology and without the institutionalism of religion. And so I was actually asked by people who were part of a a free thought group in Lake Charles, Louisiana, if I would be interested in starting a secular congregation. Hmm. My goodness. What what has has the community uh, reacted to that in a negative way or just uh, letting you be? Uh, Still with me? 
Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. It, it, yeah, I, okay. We had. I said, uh, how how has the community reacted? Just letting you be in the chapel, or have they been pretty negative to you? Actually, initially, they were very negative. Every time that we make the news again, whether it's a local television station or a local paper, or sometimes national media, there'll be a uh, there'll be a, 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 a just a bombardment of of negativity, mm-hmm. generally through social media. They've even went as far as warning other churches that we're out to steal their children somehow, mm-hmm. some way. I don't know what we'd do with all of them if we were to steal them, but <laughs> we're supposed to be stealing them. Yeah. And so, so um, you know, but we're going out of our way in order to um, to show that this is actually an act of love, yeah. that we're trying to love ourselves, love people who are like us, love people who've experienced the same outcasting that we've experienced, and at the same time, love our community by, by presenting this option this, you know, that's yeah. now available that's never been available before. So, so it's mixed, but every time we get a bump, in the media, we get a bump in the negativity. Sure. Well, one other question related to that. Uh, why, and, and I think you're probably better qualified to answer this than anybody I've talked with, why do you think people have such a hard time understanding atheism and the fact that values, purpose, and a hunger for community can all exist outside of religious faith? Yeah. Well, I think, first off, we're trained— uh, through our experience, our life experience, and our predominant culture within the United States, to to mix these these values together. That the the value of family, the value of tradition, all mixes with the value of of church or religion or synagogue. And so, it's not often in our particular culture at this time in American history that we divide those out. And so, when we do begin to divide those out and say, well, you can keep your religious traditions but we're also going to have family values, then that runs contrary to the idea that, um, that you, you are not able to get family values without first getting them from a creator, mm-hmm. getting them from some type of you know, religious sacred document, mm-hmm. that, that you're not able to generate those, those values within yourself. Where will you get them if you don't get them from the sacred text? Yeah. And, and that's the confusion that has been created within our culture. So uh, obviously, obviously there are ways of getting them, and we have them instinctively, internally, naturally. We have the same love for family that anyone who takes their family to church every Sunday has. Uh, I've got two questions I need you to answer very succinctly, if you will. What's the, <laughs> what's the status of the documentary film about your work, The Outcast of Beauregard Parish? We're still filming. As a matter of fact, um, a couple of the producers are in town this week. They hope to interview a few other folks. We're still filming, and uh, hopefully the movie will be released next year. Okay. And I know your book now is out, Hope After Faith, an ex-pastor's journey from faith to atheism. Uh, What could a reader look for in that? What they're going to do is they're going to live our lives. The way that we wrote the memoir, the narrative that we've created, takes you step by step, almost day for day, Hmm. through the life and the experience of a Pentecostal evangelist and a Pentecostal pastor, the ups, the downs, the trials, the sacrifices that are made when a person is trying to live for God with literally everything that they have. Is there such a thing as a Pentecostal atheist? As a Pentecostal atheist, you know, there, there probably will be before it's over. I'm excited about seeing all the changes and the, the openness that people have. Um, there's Metacostals now, and yeah. so if there can be Metacostals, maybe there can be Pentecostal atheists. Well, Jerry, I, uh, I appreciate your answers. One other question, and I really do have to be brief. Uh, what have you learned through this whole process? I have learned first and foremost the necessity of loving yourself. Uh, that if you don't love yourself the way that you really should love yourself, then it's going to be impossible for you to love your neighbor appropriately. Jerry DeWitt's story is one of courage and conviction, and most importantly, of liberation. He's the founder of the Secular Community Mission Chapel in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And he is the author of a new book just out, Hope After Faith, an ex-pastor's journey from faith to atheism. 
Uh, Jerry, I uh, admire your courage. Obviously, you are a a good thinker as well as a good feeler. And uh, it's been very insightful for me and I think for our listeners uh, to hear you. I I, uh, thank you so much for being with us here on State of Belief Radio. The pleasure was all mine.